ओके नमस्कार वेलकम टू दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन फिजिक्स एजुकेशन एंड रिसर्च दैट्स अ वेरी गुड टॉपिक वेरी रिलेवेंट टॉपिक आई विल नॉट टॉक टू यू अबाउट रिसर्च ऑल दो ऑल दो देर कैन बी समथिंग लाइक फिजिक्स एजुकेशन रिसर्च दैट्स अ स्लाइटली डिफरेंट एरिया बट आई विश टू टॉक टू अबाउट द फोर बेसिक एस्पेक्ट ऑफ फिजिक्स एजुकेशन मेनली एट द यू जी लेवल this conference is organized by space education and research foundation so very happy to be associated with this conference here uh, what is it that i am going to talk to you about it is about teaching learning of physics teaching and learning of physics that is the focus and uh, i wish to talk to you about a four fold way that means about the four corners of uh, the foundation of uh, physics education by tlt teaching learning of physics i mean physics education so this is the focus this is the aim of my talk i must acknowledge picture credits to google sources and a brief lay about me i am retired from uh, sardar patel university balab vidyanagar i am at present general secretary of iapt engaged in various uh, academic activities at the outset I wish to thank you, Professor Hariyom Watts, and the organizers, and also the participants. Although at the moment I am not able to see you, but I am sure you are joining. You are enjoying this, uh, friends. Let me take this opportunity and talk to you about uh, IAPT, Indian Association of Physics Teachers. It is about a thirty-four-year-old organization, academic organization. IAPT is a grassroots organization working for upgradation of physics teaching and physics teachers through various academic programs and activities these are conducted all over india and we operate through regional councils spread across the whole country for example in our gujarat and the union territory we have rc7 that is regional council 7 very active council uh, for various activities in this is education okay now uh, i will go to the main topic the main theme our focus here is on teaching and learning of physics in brief i will call it tlp i wish to discuss the four basic aspects of the development of the subject of physics namely observations and experiments the heart of physics you can say or science in general science is observational or experiential you do experience and then go from uh, theory to experiments or experiment through theory the second aspect is hypothesis that is a mental activity hypothesis theory modeling friends when i say that number 1 is this number 2 is this i don't mean to necessarily emphasize that first observation and then theory it could be otherwise also because our human mind is very creative they might think they, they they start thinking about some theory or modeling or some ideas and then it may go to experiments but let us say let us say that these are the two aspects i wish to discuss and also historical accounts stories and anecdotes that will make this subject more interesting especially from the students point of view but we should also know as teachers we should know the historic background how it happened for example how is it that uh, isaac newton came to to formulate uh, the law of gravitation and there might be anecdotes also some stories that will make the subject more interesting and finally applications of the subject and multidisciplinary aspects so these are the four uh, points i have in mind in this uh, in this uh, talk presentation <clears throat> okay so perhaps uh, when i talk about all such points some of you will find uh, it is surprising it looks surprising you will say some of you at least perhaps the idea in your mind uh, what you have in mind is that something uh, this is uh, not in our syllabus or in a textbook for example in a in a syllabus or in a textbook you don't have a chapter 1 on history of physics or chapter 2 on theory versus experiment so this this might be something new but then 
don't worry don't worry we will make it interest it interesting it will not be a dry dull discussion on uh, theoretical aspects or even you call it uh, philosophical aspects we will make it interesting by giving examples of physics and then there will be some anecdotes also okay right now friends please enjoy this two dimensional experience two dimensional experience on a flat universe yes flat universe of mobile or laptop screen i am there before you you are not there at the moment but you will be there on the flat laptop screen on this uh, online webinar and uh, and please note one particular thing something very interesting please note uh, that we receive information and data from eyes and from ears simultaneously it's going on your eyes are working your ears are working and your brain your mind is controlling the observations they they work in unison how nicely it works eyes ears minds wonderfully wonderfully working what is more fundamental my dear friends is an amazing trait of human nature a great gift from nature is curiosity curiosity which inspires observations and i want to quote an example let me quote look at this ah here is an equation of course a very simple equation very well known equation t is equal to 2 pi under root of length l by g everybody knows about this you say that this is from simple pendulum and simple harmonic is very well known simple 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 physics starts with something simple but friends i want to talk to you about the curiosity and observations this is the equation we derive it in simple harmonic motion so where is the question of curiosity that is your curiosity okay fine here is a man behind simple pendulum galileo it all started with curiosity and observations just tell you what happened out of curiosity galileo galilei observed the swings of the chandeliers hanging from a cathedral ceiling perhaps he was praying but with open eyes with open eyes and mind he saw the chandeliers oscillating chandeliers of different lengths then he performed therefore experiments and arrived at the laws of pendulum simple pendulum they were only laws of simple pendulum dependence on length dependence uh, not on mass and so on he performed careful experiments the theory that is the equation that uh, we have shown came up later probably with hooks and others the concept of simple harmonic motion and uh, linear restoring force came up later and we have the theory we teach in under uh, not even in undergraduate in 11th to 12th standard and now as per our list you may ask what are the applications of simple pendulum oh yeah, applications applications for almost 300 years our clocks were working on simple pendulums simple pendulum has been the time keeper of the world time keeper of the of the of the human civilization now of course we have quartz clocks and digital clocks and so on but but let us not forget simple pendulum oscillating in our old clocks so curiosity observations experiments theory and application everything is here everything is here this is just one of the several examples physics began with isaac newton in the year 1642 galileo passed away and isaac newton was born newton was motivated by the work of galileo on one side and kepler on the other side so let us talk briefly about newton's three laws of motion this is a basic uh, uh, aspect basic physics it starts with newton's laws of motion and we say newton's first law inertia second law f equal to ma the third law is action reaction fine very good it all uh, gave rise to what is known as newtonian mechanics the 
the beginning of classical mechanics. Uh, mechanics is the study of the laws of motion, the forces, interaction, how a particular kind of motion takes place or even the motion is restricted, slowing down or acceleration and things like that. At this stage, if you are asking about applications and technologies based on mechanics or classical mechanics, well, please wait for a few minutes. Very soon we will mention space science and technology. And <laughs> it is full of applications. Just wait for a few minutes. But at the moment, let me also mention that physics was known as a natural philosophy. If you ask Isaac Newton what is physics, then he will be fumbled, confused. Because the word physics was coined later on. It was known as natural philosophy in the beginning, in the times of Isaac Newton. Very nice. Look at this picture, very well known. Isaac Newton sitting under an apple tree and observing the things. He saw that an apple, a ripe apple fell. You know, that was uh, the story. But something else is there. At the moment, you can see Isaac Newton sitting under an apple tree and uh, having notes. He was uh, noting down the things. Now, something about Isaac Newton and his story. It so happened that in the days of uh, 1665, a great plague disease, pandemic or a, let us say epidemic, great plague broke down in uh, London. In those days, all the schools and colleges were closed down, something that is happening right now here. So Newton had to go back. He went back to his village. In a way, he was introvert almost in isolation. Today we talk about isolation as a necessary measure, but by nature Isaac Newton was isolated. He would be always engrossed in his own thoughts. So then, he might have thought about apple falling and he also thought something else. The question in his mind out of curiosity was, why is it that the moon is not falling, the apple is falling, and there are planets and uh, how is it going on? How is it going on? This was his idea. He was trying to connect his mechanics, the laws of motion with the motion of uh, moon or planets, for example. Newton's law of gravitation was inspired by Kepler's third law of planetary motion. Kepler analyzed, studied, all the gigantic data on uh, the motion of planets, you know, data collected by Tycho Brahe, his guru. And he arrived at uh, Kepler, arrived at three laws of planetary motion. I quote here the third law, which says that T squared is proportional to A, a cube, where A is the semi-major axis of the elliptical orbit of a planet around the sun, and T is the periodic time. The third law, Kepler's third law says that T square is proportional to A cube. We are not writing an equation because that will need proportionality constant. So with this, with this background, Isaac Newton started. Newton started, I'll tell you something more about that. But Newton started with um, Kepler's third law and he connected the simple way in which uh, his mechanics can be connected to this observation t square proportional to a cube. In a simple way, we can think of a, a circular orbit of a planet. You can assume it like that. For a circular motion to take place, you need centripetal force. And the centripetal force is due to the gravitation. For example, the moon moving around the earth or the planets moving around the sun. And combining these two, you can arrive at um, Kepler's law, starting with you, Newton's law of gravitation. So this was some some sort of a logic behind um, the explanation. He, and he arrived at the uh, inverse square law of uh, gravitation. Kepler was the beginning and Newton was inspired by his work. Very nice. But my, my idea is to tell you some story. Newton and Edmund Halley. The story goes that uh, after all these developments, um, 
around 1682, it was Edmund Halley who happened to be a friend, one of the few friends of Isaac Newton. He went to Isaac Newton and asked about the motion of a planet or, or sometimes a comet appears in the sky, perhaps it is periodic. So then Newton said, oh, I have done it. I have done it. I have a good note with me. Then Halley says, do you show me the notes? Newton said, okay, um, you come after a week, I will find out my notes. Oh, maybe a few years are passed. And so now again, uh, Edmund Halley visits Isaac Newton and requests him to show the notes about uh, the law of gravitation. Poor Newton, Isaac Newton, he had to apologize because he had lost the notes. And so he could not answer anything at the moment. But then Edmund Halley said, my dear Isaac Newton, you are a great genius. You can write down the notes again. Please do it. I will come after a month. So the story goes that Edmund Halley came to Isaac Newton after a month or so. And uh, Newton had prepared excellent notes about all the explanations. Newton wrote down, showed it to, he had written down already, he showed it to Halley and Halley was impressed by the notes. So then Halley requested Newton to please elaborate all these ideas and uh, think of writing a book. The book was written as a philosophy, naturalis, principia, mathematica in Latin language, something like this. It was published in 1687. So he forgot or he misplaced the notes and we got the whole book. And this is how from the book, the world came to know about Newton's laws of motion, Newton's law of gravitation and the beginning of Newtonian mechanics. So we must thank not only Isaac Newton, but also had Edmund Halley, the friendship and of course the forgetful nature of uh, Edmund Halley. This is the story. The Halley Comet is very famous now. It was uh, seen in our skies. I have shown, I have seen, I have shown the Halley Comet in the days of um, 1985 or 86. And young men, young, young people in this conference, please note, the Halley Comet will be coming again in our skies in 2062 or so. It is a periodic time of a revolution of about 75 years. Please do watch it in future. Okay, so this is the story of my friends. There is another interesting problem, a historic problem that was uh, solved by Isaac Newton. And that is uh, something I wish to mention. Let me also mention the famous Brachistochrone problem. Brachistochrone problem, which was purely a theoretical or a mathematical challenge. It was a challenge from one mathematician to another genius, Isaac Newton. Um, before I tell you something more about this uh, Brachistochrone problem, I wish to show you a demo, a demo, a simple demo. This uh, demo was uh, videoed, video shooting was taken at the Community Science Center in Vallabhidyanagar. It's a very simple idea. In a frame, vertical frame, there are uh, two rods. One is a straight rod, the other is a curvature. The curve is actually cycloid. But the point is that uh, we release the two objects, two heavy cylinders simultaneously and see what happens. First of all, see the demo. Uh, the demo, the video is shown in normal speed. It is a four second video and it is also repeated in slow motion. Have a look at this demo and then we talk about this. This is a very interesting and a famous problem known as the Brachistochrone problem. It will, it will take a few seconds. Have a look. Please watch it carefully. Hmm? Okay. See the two cylinders rolling down. One of them coming faster than the other. Then the other. If you have watched this carefully, now let me tell you about the problem. The problem is that in a vertical plane in a gravitational field, there are two points A and B. 
the question is which is the path along which the time taken from time taken to travel from a to b is minimum the shortest distance is a straight line but the shortest time corresponds to that curve and that curve is a particular geometrical curve known as cycloid now what is that curve the problem was posed by john bernoulli from france and it was floated the problem went to royal society of london and naturally it was handed over to isaac newton isaac newton had a close look at the problem the time minimization problem in gravitational field so maybe after lunch he sat down hmm, and it is said that uh, he, he could solve the problem in about uh, two or three hours he solved the problem exactly and uh, handed it over to royal society but he did not write his own name so the problem was again passed on to the uh, french mathematician jonas bernoulli but the name was not isaac newton it was anonymous or something else the solution came to uh, the originator mathematician jonas bernoulli he had a close look at the solution the way elegantly the way in which it was solved and it came from uh, london so then he said okay the name is not written but i can i can tell you i am so sure that the solution is provided by none other than isaac newton yes why because because a lion is known by his paws that was isaac newton the genius the genius apart from uh, all this my friends apart from a demo apparatus which is available at many places a lot of literature on uh, relevant theory and experiments is available you can find it in uh, google search i would recommend you to please also read a beautiful article on theory and experiment see also please an article by professor pc deshmukh and others in the resonance uh, journal of science education i wish to emphasize that there is a long standing connection between astronomy and physics actually physics owes its existence to astronomy there is a close link there is an enduring bondage i would say between the two we have what is known as astrophysics we try to use apply the laws of physics to understand the phenomena of astronomy it has also given rise to cosmology which is the the science which is the discipline which studies how the universe originated and of course we have space science and technology as an option space science and technology it starts with rocket launching and the rocket launching makes use of newton's third law of motion application we use the law of gravitation to study the orbits various orbits and space science and technology it has greatly heralded a new era in uh, interdisciplinary physics with this of course we have astrochemistry look at this we are now going from physics to other areas of discipline astrochemistry is about uh, the origin or uh, abundance of molecules and their reactions in outer space astrobiology very interesting very exciting astrobiology tries to answer the question is there any life outside the earth so we feel that by birth physics is interdisciplinary simple classical well known examples okay let us come back to the earth and all that in physics which one comes first theory or experiment of course our four way list goes like uh, first observation number 1 i have given to observations and experiment then hypothesis and theory but the development is not necessarily in that order sometimes the idea clicks to our mind and then we try to see whether it is working in practice actually at the moment when we look at the right at, at these aspects right now it is the history that comes to us first we are describing historical developments i wish to take you to the 19th century in london a young man is doing experiments a very keen observer very keen experimenter 
is working in his lab. What is it? It is Michael Faraday and we are all familiar with Michael Faraday's law of induction, electromagnetic induction. What happens is that uh, a magnet is passed quickly through a coil. So the magnetic field associated with the coil is changing, either inserting or withdrawing. And we have the phenomenon of uh, induced EMF, the electromagnetic induction. When the magnetic flux linked with a circuit or a coil undergoes a change, an EMF is induced. How do you know about the EMF induced? Perhaps there was no bulb, electric bulb in those days. So Faraday connected the galvanometer to show the, um, the strength of the EMF and the direction also. So that was the beginning. It started with experiments. And here is Michael Faraday, a teen ox experimenter, an observer, but a very well sought after speaker in uh, public meetings on science. Faraday was known for giving interesting lecture demo and his famous Christmas lectures in London were very well known. So that was a very, very unique personality in the history of science that was Michael Faraday. And now a brief history and a story. It so happened, friends, that Faraday went to a minister in those days and showed his discovery. The minister was not much impressed. He said, well, young man, you have done something new. But what is the use of your discovery? Use? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Faraday says, with this gadget, you will be able to earn taxes from the people one day. Oh, taxes. Very nice. <laughs> the minister says. And then he says, oh, please, please go ahead. Do your work. Now, it has come true today. Today, the electrical generators in our all of our power stations, electric power station, they essentially work on Faraday's law of induction. And taxes, oh, have a look at the electricity bill. Hmm? You will find a component of taxes. Of course, I am not paying electric bill these days. Yes, because I am producing solar energy through my rooftop solar panels. These days, of course, uh, we have cloudy situation. But this is a very interesting story. Well, my friends, at this stage, I want to show you a simple demo. Another simple demo. Uh, this is uh, very interesting because it connects classical physics with modern physics. How is it possible? In a simple demo, in some instrument, can you connect these two things? Yes, it is possible. But before I tell you anything further, please have a look. Please watch the video carefully. It is a simple instrument where uh, I am producing light by rotating a handle. You can see kinetic energy converted into light energy. And this is possible with our uh, electromagnetic induction. We are employing Faraday's law of uh, electromagnetic induction. You can see the light is glowing. I hope you can see it is shown again and again. Watch it carefully. I have a small uh, gadget, a small device in my hand. Have a look at this. Uh, first of all, I'll show you what is happening. What I am doing is to turn the handle, handle, and you can see, you can see that the bulb is glowing. The bulb is glowing. This is like a dynamo, a dynamo, as if I am repeating Faraday's experiment. But here, a coil is uh, rotating in a static magnetic field, so the EMF is produced and the EMF will be fed, the voltage will be fed to an LED, light emitting diode, and it glows. Try, let us try, let us try again. Have a look at this. I'm doing it again. If you do it faster, then the glow is a little, a little more, you can see. So this is the idea. We are showing Faraday, Faraday's law of uh, electromagnetic induction, the phenomenon. And the advantage is that even if you produce a small voltage, uh, uh, then the corresponding uh, glow is quite bright because it is LED, light emitting diode. That is the advantage. So you can do it easily. This is a simple demo, demo for electromagnetic induction. Thank you. Seen this, then let me proceed further. Yes, indeed. 
if the bulb, the light that is glowing is LED. And my friends, LED, light emitting diode, is a modern gift from physics and electronics. So from the days of Faraday, we have come to the modern age of LED. That is how our lighting and all other things are working. But essentially the point is that for generation of electricity, we use something like dynamo or electric generators. So the basic idea is from classical physics. Okay, very nice. So with this demo then, I want to proceed further and I want to tell you about the mid 19th century. Apart from Faraday, a few other experimental discoveries uh, were made by others. Basic laws of electricity and magnetism were established empirically or experimentally. And then comes a turning point. So you see, several laws of electricity and magnetism were known, but the intrinsic connection, inherent connection between the two aspects, electricity and magnetism was not known. And then came a turning point, the basic theory. 1864, Maxwell's four basic equations connecting all these phenomena. And he formulated what is known as electrodynamics. Electrodynamics is the study of uh, alternating time dependent electric and magnetic fields. They mutually affect each other. So it was a unifying theory. In four basic equations, Maxwell unified all the laws of electricity and magnetism and gave something new also. As a result of this, he said, light is an electromagnetic wave phenomenon. It was known to be something like a wave, but Maxwell says it is, it is an electromagnetic wave phenomenon. This is Maxwell, James Clark Maxwell. And with this, a coherent picture of all kinds of different electromagnetic radiations, different frequencies, different wavelengths, and identical speed in the medium. This is the coherent picture. In this connection, I want to write down here because I like one particular equation. You see, when dealing with physics, mathematics is essential. Mathematical equations cannot be avoided. Have a look at this. It's a small and a beautiful equation. C is equal to 1 upon under root of, under root of epsilon 0 mu 0. You will say it's a small equation. What is so beautiful about it? Oh, it is beautiful. Because in this equation on the left hand side, you have see the speed of light in vacuum. On the right hand side, you have uh, two fundamental constants, uh, the properties of uh, free space. Epsilon zero and mu zero. What is interesting is that on the left hand side you have the speed of light which is measured by some optical experiments. On the left hand side you have optics. On the right hand side you have electromagnetism, the basic electric and magnetic properties of uh, the free space or you can write it for a medium also. And the equality shows that they are connected. They are connected. This wonderful connection link was established through Maxwell's equation. So the point is that we should try to understand the beauty of the equations of physics. They are not merely mathematical equations. They are equations of physics. They are telling you something. They are telling you something. We should try to find out what it means. Okay, fine. Now we we'll look at the electromagnetic spectrum. Just to give you the highlight of the applications. Starting from radio waves and microwaves, going to IR, then visible light, UV, X-rays, gamma rays. In that order, you can see the wavelengths in going from left to right is decreasing, frequency is increasing. Just to highlight, just to highlight a few applications. If you talk about um, radio waves, you have MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, which is a phenomenon of a nuclear magnetic resonance. It has applications in medical fields. Microwaves are used for communication. You have microwave oven based on the microwave absorption by water molecules. Atomic molecular physics comes into picture. We have thermal scanners these days for uh, detecting whether there is any temperature that is a uh, fever or so. 
they are based on IR thermal scanners. We have visible light, Raman scattering, which is a phenomenon in the visible light, visible range, and it has a lot many applications. Raman spectroscope is full of application, multidisciplinary applications. I'm just telling you without any details. Then you come to X-rays and gamma rays. So many medical applications. X-ray diffraction, another field of uh, multidisciplinary research. So electromagnetic spectrum takes you from physics to all fields of science and technology. That is what I wanted to drive home. Now, I want to take you to the year 1885. We have heard of Angstrom, the unit of Angstrom. It was named after spectroscopic Angstrom. So in those days, Angstrom meets Balmer, who was a school maths teacher, mathematics teacher. And Angstrom showed his results on the experiments with spectral lines of element hydrogen. He showed the result. Here is the spectrum of hydrogen, line spectrum of element hydrogen. Of course, uh, this is rather exaggerated. You don't have such thick lines, thick short bands. They are not. They are not bands. The actual uh, actual spectrum is a line spectrum, very thin lines, and the intensity is also not the same. But this is just to to make it uh, clear, we are showing the hydrogen spectrum. You can see the four numbers, they are the spectral and the wavelengths of the spectral lines. And these are the first four lines of the Balmer series of hydrogen spectrum. So our um, Balmer, who was a mathematics teacher, he looked at the numbers. He looked at the numbers like lambda wavelength 6563 in Angstrom. The first one, then four, eight, six, one, and so on. He thought of arranging these numbers in terms of a series. And this is the famous expression for the Balmer series of the hydrogen spectrum. If you take n equal to three, four, five, six, you arrive at the different lines of the Balmer series and series, and then more also are possible. This was not a theory, it was only an empirical formula, but it was taken up by Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr took up the question of the stability of the atom and the lines emitted, spectral lines emitted by the atom and arrived at Bohr atom model. It all started when a, an experimentalist made, met a mathematician. So in the earlier 20th century, new emerging ideas out-of-box thinking gave rise to the dawn of the quantum era, Planck, Einstein, and Bohr. <clears throat> I want to mention about quantization or discretization. Quantization of uh, radiation. It means that the energy of the radiation flows in the form of discrete packets of energy, not continuously as a wave, and we also talk about quantization in matter or let us say in radiation we say that there are phenomena which can be understood by wave nature other phenomena by uh, corpuscular nature and so there is a dual nature of radiation similarly dual nature of, of uh, matter also took place and the new era started the new era of course the theoretical ideas were corroborated by experiments also. I wish to mention particularly a period of 30 years, 1900 to 1930, 30 years that shook physics and changed the whole world. It, it has a profound impact on our life today, even in 21st century. These are the two people, Bohr and Einstein, what if they debated on theoretical aspects? And then we have quantum mechanics. I wish to talk to you about laser, which is an outstanding example. Look, the idea of laser, actually idea of stimulation, stimulated emission came from the mind of the genius, Albert Einstein. Here is something that started with ideas, part of an idea. It started with an elegant theoretical model proposed for a stimulated emission. It was a simple but exact theory and Einstein said, oh, I don't know whether it can be achieved in, in, in practice. So, okay, okay, I have the theory. 
Einstein said. Then uh, the new development took place. After four decades, the first actual stimulated emission, that is laser device, came up in 1960. There were various laser sources and of course, soon after, there were applications in science and technology, physics in multidisciplinary aspect, science and technology fields, even medicine. For example, there is what is known as Excimer laser. And I want to give you a highlight of lasers in various fields, medicine and healthcare. You can see, I was uh, talking to you about um, Excimer laser, which is an ophthalmology. Excimer laser is a word coined from two words, excited dimer. A dimer is uh, something different from diatomic molecule. You can try to find it out. But we were able, the people were able to find the laser emission from certain excited dimer molecules and it is useful for ophthalmology. Lasers are used for defense and security. We have uh, laser guided bombs and other things are there. We have other enforcements and uh, other applications, for example, laser fingerprinting. Spectroscopy, laser is a very important tool for Raman effect. It gives you better resolution, uh, better, better detection of Raman spectra and so spectroscopy and of course other fields. There are commercial and entertainment applications of lasers. We have laser printers and we have laser light shows we have seen in some programs. And so wonderful world of uh, applications of lasers from theory to experiment to applications. That's really wonderful. That makes the study of uh, physics so interesting. Friends, this uh, motivates me to talk to you about a rather theoretical idea. A philosophical idea but with some uh, some more interest you can also try to explore it all starts with curiosity and creativity so i can think of a knowledge pyramid conceptual idea in a knowledge pyramid the foundation the base is creativity curiosity and knowledge this is at the beginning of uh, everything that we have in mind Curious mind, creative mind gives rise to something. You observe something, the processing takes place. We have the understanding that is the creation of the mind and it is knowledge. Knowledge is uh, something that you apply. When you think of a problem and find its solution, it is the knowledge that works. So essentially it is here, it is shared. It is shared. I am very happy to mention a very interesting um, shloka. There are two, two lines. It's a couplet from our Sanskrit Sibhashit. And uh, I can tell you, Na chora haryam, na rajya haryam, na bratru bhajyam, na chabharakari. Vidya, knowledge is something which cannot be stolen by a thief. It cannot be uh, burdensome. Even the taxes cannot be there on the knowledge. If you earn money, of course, the tax is there. But the, the master stroke is Jaye Krute Vardhata Evanityam Vidyadhanam Sarvadhanam Pradhanam. Knowledge increases by sharing. Knowledge something that increases by sharing. So that is the foundation. From the foundation comes um, scientific uh, development, discoveries and inventions. Some philosophical idea, but you will find it meaningful. Then from discoveries and inventions come the technology. Laser, for example, best example I gave you. Technology and then gadgets. Many of you, most of you are using laser pointer in our PPT presentation. I don't have it right now, but it is well known. From, from uh, gadgets, your products like laser show experiment, uh, laser show or demo, demo. And from technologies, gadgets and products, we reach we reach out to market and economy. <laughs> that is something far beyond uh, physics and science and technology, but uh, somehow physics is playing a role in markets and technologies. And then the aim is of course, uh, aim is of course good quality life. 
the aim is also to satisfy our curiosity but generally for the purpose of society good quality life is the purpose and then friends there are always challenges at the moment the whole world not only gujarat or india the whole world is facing a big challenge in the form of the pandemic covid 19 created by corona virus whenever there is a challenge we go back to the base of this uh, pyramid we go back to the foundation we meet the challenge through curiosity creativity knowledge that's how people are now working for new vaccines new medicines and we will be surely able to meet the challenge okay so this is how a very general philosophical view also emerges about physics and uh, i am uh, very close to ending my uh, ppt lecture in theoretical in sorry in, in uh, teaching and learning of physics we can highlight how quantum mechanics gives a picture about the structure of atoms and molecules and then solids then we also know about the semiconductors the semiconductors gives rise to electronics in a semiconductor electronics and then ic's computers ict artificial intelligence robotics quantum computing we are now uh, in the future of 21st century there are new emerging horizons of the 21st century it all starts with basic physics i am here at the end of my uh, slide this is the last slide and i am tempted to tell you some story very interesting story story is indian purely indian story friends i wish to mention two famous quantum theories and there is a why there is a reason why i am mentioning this particular aspect what are the two theories one is bose einstein statistics see after some detailed this discussion um, it is time to relax it is time to time for me to tell you some joke but it is connected with basic theories bose einstein statistics one kind of a theory in quantum mechanics fermi dirac statistics another kind of a uh, of a theory statistics tells you about the number of particles with respect to energy distribution that is statistics in in um, quantum mechanics let us say under quantum rules of course um, fermi dirac statistics is obeyed by fermions for example electrons and they obey pauli exclusion principle no two electrons can be in a one particular well defined quantum state if uh, three of the four quantum numbers are the same same then the spin must be opposite this is well known so they obey pauli exclusion principle and this is shown by two particles two electrons with opposite spins in a particular quantum state as against this for bosons there is no restriction like uh, pauli exclusion principle it is like a crowded train and we should avoid avoid crowding these days okay for bosons the particles are being both ions and statistics there is no such restriction of pauli principle exclusion principle an example of bosons is photons so bosons as i said have no such restriction and typically it is like this crowding see the difference fermions bosons and now comes a very interesting story from the background of our own country you know sn bose was an indian physicist he worked with einstein and developed bose einstein statistics there is also a concept of bose einstein condensation which is later on achieved in uh, practice and the famous joke friends it so happened that in 1950 professor p a m dirac one of the founders of fermi dirac statistics visited s n bose in kolkata kolkata of these those days okay so dirac and bose were there in some conference and uh, for the whole day they were discussing serious theories serious uh, uh, deliberations or we it went on in the evening it was time to relax time to go for some visit so then bose said dr dirac 
let us go for a visit in Kolkata. That was very nice. So he requested Professor Dirac and his wife to come to his car. Both said, Professor Dirac, both of you please come to the back seat. So in the back seat, there were only two people for the purpose of, you know, comfort. comfort. There were only two people in the back seat. In the front seat, of course, the driver was Asen Bose himself, who was rather hefty. He told two of his students to come to the front seat. The students were slim, so they accommodated. They started, the car was started, and then after uh, moving a few, uh, for a few, for some distance, Bose saw one more of his students. So he halted the car and told the student to come, come on, come on, come to the front seat, we will adjust. Now that was too much in the front seat, so many people. So naturally Dirac said, Professor Bose, let him come to the back seat. Uh, we are only two here. And listen to the answer given by Professor Bose. Bose retorted to Dirac, Professor Bose, that is your statistics in the back seat. And this is my statistics in the front seat. No problem. Okay. <laughs> Get the point. <laughs> this is a famous joke. It is a lot of Indianness, and we can be proud of such a joke. Front seat, both hands on statistics, no restriction on the number. Back seat, Pauli Susan principle, only two. So in fact, uh, Bose uh, said this and uh, his uh, Dirac's wife could not understand. So Dirac had to explain <laughs> what is Bose on, how they behave and formula. So that is the interesting story. I wish to end up with this interesting story. I'll be happy to receive your questions and comments. I wish to thank again the organizers and of course participants. Thank you so much. Daniwal. End of my lecture. Thank you.